Hello, and again, this meeting is being recorded. If you do not consent to have your video recorded or your audio, please turn them off. Uh, as note, this seminar will be posted to the Kingdom YouTube page. Additionally, a reminder of the SCA harassment and bullying policy. The SCA prohibits harassment and bullying of all individuals and groups. Participants engaging in this behavior are subject to appropriate sanctions. If you are subjected to harassment, bullying, or retaliation, or if you become aware of anyone being harassed or bullied, please contact a seneschal, the president of the SCA, or your kingdom's board ombudsman. Man. And that takes care of our office, so I will turn it back over to our wonderful uh, instructor. Thank you so much. All right. Um, as Elena mentioned, this is a class on self-stuffed buttons and buttonholes. Um, as people may or may not know, buttons have been around for quite a while. Uh, the area that I'm going to be focusing on is primarily a more European view. They may have been present during this time period in other areas as well. However, I don't quite know about those areas and have not gone in depth into them. So just realize that. Um, we first see buttons showing up in about the 1300s, um, you find them with actual cloth remains from burials and things of that nature. Um, it easily could have been around before then, considering the fact that fabric is not something that survives very well. Um, you need to have very ideal conditions for fabric to actually survive to modern times times from or things of that nature. We do have a few cases where they did survive. Uh, we right now, as far as I know, have findings that have actual fabric buttons and buttonholes from Greenland, the Netherlands, Austria, England, and Germany. So quite a few places. Uh, and as I said, starting from about the 1300s to the end of period. Before that time, we do know that buttons existed to an extent. However, a lot of them were decorative, so we don't know how functional they were. So if you see them in artwork, there is a chance that they are purely decorative. The fabric buttons that we found in various places, you can physically see they were functional. So that's why I'm saying we're not really sure when they started. I'm just going off of by when we actually had them in a physical sense, not just in artistic sense. So some examples of these findings that I've been talking about, you have London finds, which if you can see from these, you have very close set buttonholes and buttons. Um, this one is from the 14th century, so their later period, uh, later 1300s. Um, you have some self-stuffed buttons right here from those same London finds. They have fabric shanks that you can see. Um, and you can just find a whole bunch of examples from those particular London finds of all sorts of buttons. Then you have something like this article. Um, it's a pleading and smocking article. Uh, you can see from the Austrian Lengberg finds. So this is the 15th century. Um, actual buttons and buttonholes. These are on sleeves here. So it would be the very end of an opening. Uh, it was sewn very close to the edge in that particular example. Um, you have additional things from the Tudor period where you, this one is artwork, but it's a functional button. Um, so that would be a little bit later, that 16th century. Um, and then you just have a whole bunch of random examples. Uh, so there's ruffs and collars that you find where they're closed with buttons and button loops for the buttonholes and things of that nature. Um, they're present in a wide variety of styles. 
outerwear, underwear, accessories. So however you want to use them, you pretty much can. If it's something that you want to do, how to actually make buttons and buttonholes is something that varies and there is not a 100% tried and true, this is always how it's made method. There are a bunch of ways to do it. So I do suggest that you do some experimentation and see what works best for you. I have some things that I think work best for me, which I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, all of this how-to information is in a handout that I posted on the Facebook page. Um, I hope that some of you are able to take a look at it. It's about five pages and it has references in the back of some of these books that I've been showing you pictures from. Um, but before I get into exactly how to make buttons and buttonholes, I wanted to show a few real life examples of how you would actually possibly use them. So the outfit that I am wearing has a lot of buttons on it. I have buttons from the front all the way down to my feet and on both sleeves, there are buttons. Primarily on the sleeves, that's decorative, um, but it is functional. I do not need to undo any of the buttons to get this on and off though. For the actual dress, it is, can we post the link to the handout? Okay, um, let me grab that. It's located on my blog. It's the first article. Hold on, I'm trying to figure out where I actually get the captions or not captions. Type, there we go. So if you go there, it should take you to my handout. So continuing on, this dress buttons all the way down. Um, this particular one, they are all little self-stuffed. They're tiny buttons with, uh, this isn't the best background, with actual fabric or thread shanks that are very small so that you can actually pass it through the hole. And the hole is only a little bit bigger than the actual button. This is the most recent dress that I've made. So it's something that I have had practice with making it and I was able to overcome certain errors that I've made in dresses in the past. So one of the very first dresses that I made, same thing as what I'm wearing, except the buttons only go down halfway. This is a dress where I learned something about buttons of, you want buttons to be on a straight edge you don't want buttons to go over a curved edge because it doesn't line up very well. You can kind of get around that if you put the buttons on the very, very edge of the fabric. Um, this is not on the very edge of the fabric. This is towards the front, not actually on the side. Um, but when I originally made this dress, it was a curved bust because I was used to doing lace ups and it never sat right here. I have luckily changed size since then, so I was able to actually cut the chest and straighten it out and had some weird jury rigging with getting the buttons lined up where they're supposed to be. You can see kind of had to fudge the edge of that buttonhole there to make it work. And then you need to pay attention to things like directionality if you're doing sleeves. These sleeves are upside down, the buttons. On this one, you can see that the opening is at the bottom. On this dress, the opening's on the top. It's not something that most people are ever going to notice on my garb and no one has ever pointed it out. It's always me pointing it out if someone sees it. Um, but those are some things to look out for there. Um, this dress is linen, so it's not too bad to work with. Um, another dress, this one, Buttons going all the way down from the front to the bottom. Uh, this one, I have a button and sleeves as well. Um, everything with buttons, you want to make sure that the fabric is going to be thick enough to support the buttons. 
If it is not, you can do things like line it with another fabric or do a double fold of the area for the placard. This area is a double fold to make sure that you're going to have enough strength there. This particular dress is a wool and silk blend. It actually sews fairly well. Um, but the reason I pulled this dress out is because where I did buttons all the way from the chest to the floor, I got tired of doing buttons. So up top, the buttons are spaced about an inch apart. And when you get lower, I actually increase the spacing. So it's about an inch and a half between each button. Um, because it's a different visual plane, it actually makes it pretty hard to tell that the spacing is different. So it's a good way to cheat and actually have to do less buttons and buttonholes all the way down. Um, another thing that is fun to do with buttons, not just having dresses, a more unisex option, um, kirtles. This one is wool with a linen lining. This one, you can actually see the whole shank option a little bit better if I put it against something that's not red. If you haven't noticed, I kind of have a theme with colors. Um, but these have the fabric shanks and the self stuff buttons. This one, I would also like to point out with the other things I did matching threads so that you can see it, but these buttonholes are done with a contact contrast thread. They have a square shape. You don't have to do square button holes, but I happen to like the look of that. Um, and then the final show and tell piece that I have right now, just to show that, yes, you don't always have to do self stuff buttons. A little galler from my do German. Um, so this one's all wool, so the buttonholes don't have very dense stitch because it's a felted wool, so it's not going to unravel at all. But you can use all different types of buttons with this style of buttonhole. It's not something that only is going to work with the self stuff button. Okay, so that's pretty much background information for now. Before I go on to actually how to make buttons, are there any questions? Okay, since it doesn't seem like it, there are any questions, I am going to get started on how to make the buttons. So if you look into books, they have a few theories of how to do this. You have examples from the London finds where if you look at the handout, um, that doesn't have the best clarity right now. Sorry, cameras are not the best. Hopefully the images come through clearer on your end. Maybe it would work better if I take it straight from the book where it's bigger. Um, for the London finds, they start with the circle. You do a large running or basting stitch all the way around the end. You draw it in and then you run the needle up and down to reinforce things. This is a very weird way to make a button to me because it comes out very flat and there's not much filling to it. Um, it's not necessarily the look I like. If it's something that you want to try, go straight ahead. Um, this one also kind of leaves your edges exposed a little bit. So the way that you cover up those edges is you have to actually attach it with the shank wrapping around the bottom of it and it's encased inside the shank. Um, like I said, not my favorite way to do it. If you look in the Tudor Taylor book that I have listed in the handouts, they have a slightly different way of going about doing buttons there. They actually start out with a square instead of a round. Maybe you can see that. There we go. Um, so same thing as with the London finds. This one you make a large basting stitch all the way around the outside edge. Pull it in, but as you pull it in, you tuck the outside edges in to be the stuffing. 
and then pull it closed and taut to actually make the button. There are a lot of things like that, that it'll just be scrunching a circle in. It, it's a button, you can't do it too many variations outside of that. However, in order to find out how a button is made, you must destroy the button. So that doesn't necessarily always happen because you don't want to actually destroy the artifacts that you're looking at. Um, so while those are two options, the way that I tend to do it is same way, starting with a big running stitch around the outside. However, I use that to help draw the outside edges in and then do another running stitch so that everything's already inside to pull it in. Um, I actually learned how to do it that way at a class and I'll show you how to do it. Um, many years ago, I don't remember what event it was at. However, this particular class focused more on uh, the stranded buttons, the buttons that have the embroidery on top of a wooden bead. So that was where a lot of that focus was. But to actually start with, I prefer starting with a circular piece of fabric. I trace a random object in my house. In this case, I have a bottle of leather oil that happens to be the perfect size for the buttons that I like to make for my clothing. Uh, the top of it is about one and three quarters inches. The bottom of it's about two and a half inches. If I'm making something for my dress, the one and three quarters diameter is a convenient size for what I like. Uh, the bottom tends to work better for things like when I made a surcoat for a fighter of mine, or when I make hoods, sometimes I like the bigger button as well. Um, either way, buttons come in a variety of sizes, so you don't have to pick one of the two sizes that I mentioned. Anywhere from a diameter of about an inch and a half to three inches is typically what we have found, or assumed to have found based on the size of the round button. Um, so first things first, to actually make a button, and I want to point this out first, always have your button or make your button before you cut your button holes. It's much easier to adjust a button hole to fit your button than it is to try and make a button to fit your button hole. So I'm just going to quickly trace a very rough circle on my fabric and cut it out to begin. And I am realizing I never grabbed a needle to do this. So I will have to step away for a couple of seconds and be right back. Okay, so I have a crappily cut circle. It doesn't have to be perfect at all. All the edges are getting shoved into the middle anyway. No one's ever going to see it. I am doing this with some wool yarn right now because I have a lot of it and it's a good contrasting color for the circle. I would not actually make a button with this. I would make it with a sewing thread, um, linen or silk, if you want to do something of a more period appropriate material. Um, if you don't care about that, any sort of sewing machine thread or buttonhole thread or anything of that nature is fine. So right now I'm just making a tiny knot with the thread near the edge of the fabric. So right now I have a circle with a piece of thread tied to the edge. That's it. As I mentioned with all of the pictures from the books, you start out with a basting or running stitch around the outside of the circle.
Okay, so now I have something that looks like this. Nothing fancy to it. The stitches aren't completely even, just in and out. From here, if I pull the thread, it gathers into a little bit of a ball. I can then flatten this ball and I kind of have a round disc. From here, it's another circle. So since all of the edges are now towards the middle of the ball, if I do another basting stitch around the outside edge of this, it's easy to gather the edges around and all of the edges are already towards my middle. So I don't have to fiddle with that square example like I showed you, you would have done this outer basting stitch and then had to force all of these little edges inside with your fingers, which maybe your fingers are big or you have long nails or you just don't have the best dexterity. And it can be really annoying trying to get all of those edges into the insides. Yes, the way I'm doing it here adds an extra step because you actually are going around again with thread. However, I think the lack of irritation of trying to get the edges in makes it worthwhile. As you saw, it really didn't take me long to do a basting stitch around the outside of this. So normally when I teach this class, it is hands-on. So people would actually be doing this with me and I'd be showing them how to do it. So this is a little bit weird, just doing everything completely by myself and not having people doing this with me. So feel free to grab some thread or some fabric and try this for yourself right now. Um, that way, if you have any questions, you can actually ask me in person um, on this. So usually it's buttonholes that people have more questions on than actual buttons, but um, I'm sorry, I forgot to show. Okay, so I have that disc with now another running stitch around the edge. Once again, if you pull, now I have a little ball. And that's pretty much a button. From here, you just want to secure it a little bit. So I'm just going to run the needle from edge to edge across a few times to try and secure a bunch of the little pleats. And as I do that, it'll gradually tighten up and become a more compact little ball. Right, so after I've done that a few times, the way you would attach this, you have the option of just cutting the string off and starting with a new piece or leaving this as a tail and going directly on. Um, for this, I'm just going to use it as a tail. Usually I do all of my buttons, make all my buttons first and cut the thread and then start with a new piece of thread to attach it to my clothes because I like doing things everything at once. So make all the buttons, attach all the buttons, make all the buttonholes. The one at a time thing like this is not my thing. Okay, so go through the fabric and then through the button across. And pull down and then back through the fabric. You're gonna do that a couple of times ideally three or four at least. Once you've done that three or four times from a few different directions through the button, you can then bring the thread up and wrap it around all those threads and it starts to make a bit of a shank. From there, take your needle and go down through all of those wraps that you just did. and pull it through. Then you wanna just tie off in a basic knot. Um, 
I have a tendency to tie off and then go back up through the shank again and pull through the button to cut off there so that I don't have any loose threads anywhere. But you don't have to do that. That's a metal matter of personal preference for me. So are there any questions about making old buttons right now? Okay, doesn't seem like there are. So your button has Sorry. some hair. Okay. So that can be for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons can be that you just made a really big button. If you made a really big button, sometimes it just doesn't compact very well when you do it. That's why usually you don't get much bigger than three inches. I don't know how big your button button was to begin with. Um, if it was bigger than three inches, that could be the issue. Uh, the other reason it might be is when you're going back and forth at the bottom to secure it after you've drawn everything in, you might need to secure it a little bit higher up. Okay, so it might be bigger than three inches. But if you secure a little bit higher up instead of uh, the camera, I hope you guys can actually see this, I'm sorry. If you go up a little higher, that helps densify up into there. Um, so when you do your passes back and forth, back and forth, that will help it. And I don't think, you shouldn't have to remember all of this right off your head. There are in my handout pictures of how to do all of this in a step-by-step -step way. And I do mention the actual sizes that are historically accurate and the best range to do for if you are actually going to do this. Um, I think I forgot to mention how to actually make a shank in my handout though, so we'll have to add that in. Okay, so now that you have your buttons, unless you are intending to just have them be purely decorative, you need to have something to put the button in. So how do we make a button hole? I have more scraps. So to figure out how big the button hole needs to be, take your button and then you're gonna cut a slit that's a little bit, a little bit bigger than your button. It's really not going to be much bigger. If you look at the dress that I'm wearing right now, the actual button is similar in size to my pinky and my pinky can go a little bit further up into that compared to what the button actually is. Um, ideally, you wanna cut it so that you're erring on the side of too small rather than too big. Um, once you cut it, see if you can push your button through. If you can't, cut it a little bit bigger. Then eventually you'll get to a size where you can actually push your button through. So it's really nothing scientific or math or anything fancy. You can do math if you want to. I think it's a lot easier to just try with the button and see what works. Once you figure out how big that size is, you can measure it and mark out where you want your buttons to go, or you can just roughly do it by eye, which is how I tend to do. Um, like I mentioned, I use my pinky as my gauge. I cut a hole that my pinky can fit into. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is going to have such a easy tool to use as that, but it works for me. So when I have my buttonhole, you're going to need to stitch it. Um, does blanket stitching the buttonhole make it any smaller? No, not really. Um, it for the edges at least, for when I do it, it helps hold some of the edges out at the 
at the cuts over here, these sides. Um, so to actually sew the blanket hole open, sorry, the buttonhole open, there are two stitches you can use. There's a blanket stitch, as was mentioned in the chat, or there's a stitch that I prefer to use that most people actually don't even realize are two separate stitches, um, but it's called a buttonhole stitch, go figure. So a blanket stitch and a buttonhole stitch are almost exactly the same. The main difference between them is the direction the needle goes into the fabric in relation to the hole. So for a blanket stitch, I'm gonna be sewing on the top of the buttonhole here. For the blanket stitch, my needle goes into the buttonhole, through the fabric on the top of the buttonhole. The bottom of my thread wraps around the top of the needle. And then I would pull down. I don't have a knot, so that didn't stay. I'll just do that once more very quickly. You know what? This is the buttonhole one. Sorry. For the buttonhole stitch. The reason why this stitch, in my mind, is a little bit better than the blanket stitch and why I accidentally default to it is that it adds an extra little twist. There's a little twist here that helps secure the thread towards the edge of it, uh, towards the edge of the hole. So for the buttonhole stitch, again, through the opening up to the top of the hole, my tailing thread goes over the needle and then I'm pulling down away from the body of the fabric over the buttonhole. That brings the knot to the inside edge of the buttonhole. If you were doing the blanket stitch, you would be starting from the top of the fabric and putting the tip of the needle through, wrapping, and then pulling. And this is just making an L. There's no twist in it. The thread is just making a little bit of an L on the edge. So you get a straight thread all the way across. It works well for things like wool. Wool does not inherently felted especially, does not fray as much as some fabrics like silk. Silk tends to be a very difficult fabric when it comes to buttons and buttonholes because it can fray a little bit more. When I'm working with silk, I tend to greatly prefer using that buttonhole stitch that I mentioned that you do that extra twist because you're coming from the hole this way. If you are doing either stitch, just remember to always pull your thread the direction across the hole. Blanket stitch or buttonhole stitch, pull it across the hole so the thread passes the opening. That way, the actual knot or wrap or whatever you want to call it, the purl is at the edge of the fabric and is going to protect the cut edge. Um, for period buttonholes, you are cutting the button before you sew it. For modern buttonholes or something that you do on a machine, typically it's the other way around. So you would do the sewing and then cut the hole. Um, so in that case, there was no raw edge start to begin with. This way you already have the raw edge that you're trying to actually encase right here. Um, so 
that's the difference with those two stitches. Uh, I'm going to cut this off so I can actually show you a proper buttonhole instead of something that's not made very neatly. So when you have a buttonhole, you want to think about a few things. Where is the tension going to be? If you have an outfit and this is the edge, here's my new buttonhole, and the button is going to be on the fabric over here, all of the tension is going to be pulling on this thread that way. So this part of the button is going to be under the most tension. So when you actually start your buttonhole, you do not want to start on this side. If you started on this side, then the opening of where you started would be in a part that needs the most strength. And that's not going to work very well. So if you start over here and then go around the edge, this part, there's an unbroken thread that you go all the way around and then back up and you can go back on to the top to complete the edge if you want. But either way, this side is going to be inherently stronger because it's in the middle of the thread, not the edge. So when you actually start, you have a few basic shapes that you can choose from. Um, so some buttonholes are a little bit looser and the edges are a little bit more rounded. Some buttonholes are much more square and some buttonholes can be very very structured and the edges are reinforced with additional stitches. I personally tend to like the square look, but I don't bother doing all of the extra reinforcement. I would like to point out that the dress that I am wearing is a self-supporting dress, so it's under a lot of tension. And even without the additional reinforcement on the edges, the buttons do hold up really well. I mentioned earlier that this is one of my newer things that I've made, so it hasn't gone through a lot of wear and tear, but the dresses that I showed earlier I've had for a few years, and even so, the edges are still in good condition. They haven't torn out, so you don't need that extra reinforcement if you don't want to do it. It is primarily for the look. Um, so your stitches don't actually need to be as close together as the modern eye typically wants them to be. You can have them spaced out fairly far, um, but you don't have to. Uh, to actually do them, as I mentioned before, I prefer the buttonhole stitch, so that's what I'm going to do. Starting on the outside edge. I tend to just leave the tail and then start sewing over it. You can anchor if you would like to. Just make sure you anchor in a place that you're going to cover. Okay, so as I'm going around here, just doing stitches all the way around until we get to the edge. When we actually get to the edge, You have a few options. If you wanted to do a rounder button, okay, so this was messy because I did it quickly. If you wanted to do a rounder button, you could then start making stitches around the opening. Um, probably two or three stitches is all that you need to actually get from one side to the other. 
if you want to do a square, I'm at the edge. I'm literally just going to flip over my fabric because I like working in one direction. And then start working on the other edge. So it ends up pretty much just having one thread go from one side to the other. Um, and this is a strong, sturdy thread. So this one, I literally just pulled from one side to the other and it's square. From here, I'd continue on to the edge. You can tie it if you want. You don't have to. I don't usually bother tying it. I will just get to the other side, put my needle underneath all of these stitches that I've just done, pull it through on the back side, and then cut it. Um, and those stitches will actually hold the end pretty well. Uh, from there, you end up, this obviously isn't finished, a little buttonhole and it works. So are there any additional questions on that? Did anybody actually try a few of the stitches? Are there questions on how to make the stitches, how the wrapping actually works? It is shown in the actual handout that I have um so examples of how to actually do it um pictures of examples from the books where they do use both stitches um, to show that historically you do see both stitch types so using one or the other isn't wrong it's kind of a matter of preference um Can I talk more about sewing buttons and holes on curved seams? Okay, so that goes into a lot of tailoring. So to make a kirtle or something like what I'm wearing right now, um, oh, I undid a button. Sorry, I was demonstrating earlier. So this front seam right here is completely and utterly straight all of the tailoring actually comes in from the side over here. If you have a bigger chest, it gets more complicated. I used to be significantly heavier, so it was a lot harder to tailor dresses for that size. Um, but the side ends up having this weird zig in it when you actually do the tailoring. If it's hard for you to get it to fit that way, you can kind of cheat the front a little bit by instead of sewing your button on the front so that the actual button shank is facing forward, you can cheat a little bit to have it so that the button shank is on the actual edge. That would be like with the collar that I made here. The buttons are completely sideways. That is because I made this particular collar to be reversible. So I can have the fur on the outside or I can have the wool on the outside. Um, if you're doing the buttons on the very edge, it's still going to have a little bit of a odd curve over the bust because one side is going to want to stick forward slightly, um, the side with the buttonholes. Um, it's not very obvious and it becomes less obvious when you put the buttons on the edge because you don't have the fabric pushing from behind to put it even more forward. Um, so the more gradual the curve, the better if you're going to try and do it that way. Um, so as an example, 
this is a hood, so it does actually have a pretty severe curve in it. That's what it looks like. When I actually put the hood on, this one, once again, the this is not good with a veil. I need to take this off quickly. When I do the buttons up in the curved section, this one would be like the curve under your bust. Um, as you can maybe see, it doesn't lay perfectly flat. This edge wants to lift up a little bit. Um, so if you're doing something with more tension, okay, I'm unpopping my buttons as I pull. If you do something with more tension, it doesn't look straight. You kind of see that there's still a curve, or at least I hope you can see. Um, and that can be a little bit of a problem for a straight front of a button because you want it to look straight. Uh, this is a very dramatic curve, so it's going to be a little bit more emphasized than it would be if you were doing something very gradual. But eh, it's never going to look perfect. So that's something that you'll have to accept if you can't get the tailoring to be right. There are a lot of fitting guidelines of how to actually try and get a straight front for a larger bust if that's what you have. Um, for a smaller bust, it's actually really not hard at all to do the tailoring. If you have basic tailoring experience, <laughs> that sounds a little bit odd, but pin fitting is one of the easiest ways to do it. So if you can find a friend, to help you make a pattern to make the front duster as possible. That's going to be the easiest way to do it. Um, did I answer your question there? Or do you want me to go into any more different parts of that? Okay, and all right. And someone is asking about if they wanted to give a set of buttons as largesse. The absolute minimum you would give. Um, so one of the smaller things that I do with buttons are hoods. The other option that I do of small things are sleeves. As you can tell here, each sleeve has 10 buttons. I am not a very big person. 10 to 12 buttons is probably the minimum I'd wanna put on a sleeve if I'm going all the way up to the elbow. You could maybe get away with six if you went partially up the forearm because you have two arms. 12 is probably the minimum I'd want to give. Uh, 20 to 24 might be something more realistic. Um, 20 to 24 gives you the option of doing something from about here to here as an option down the front of a dress or the front of a surcoat for a man, or they can do sleeves. So you have a lot more options there. Um, and buttons don't have to be the same color as what you're doing. You can have a contrasting, um, okay, I guess I already answered that one. Um, they don't have to match the garment, so you don't have to necessarily worry that they don't have the exact same fabric. Um, the buttons themselves that I have seen usually match each other. Um, I'm not going to say hard and fast that that's always the case because I'm sure people can find examples. But usually all the buttons on a seam are the same. Um, obviously, I'm wearing a dress and an overdress where 
the buttons on my outfit are not the same color, but they are completely separate items. One is a full underdress, one's a full overdress. Um, so if you manage to get eight two inch squares out of the scrap, you could do smaller buttons. Um, I don't know if you've already got them. Uh, a lot of the time I, I like to do circular ones because you corners and you don't need it to square, just shove a little circle in and you can fit them into odd places. Um, so maybe you can get... Um, if you have scraps that are the same color, go ahead. Um, but yeah, if it's that small so that you're only able to get a few, I probably wouldn't use those for large S. Um, if you have scraps that you would like to actually make use of, maybe put buttons on children's clothing. Um, or you do occasionally run into things where you're not going to have very many buttons. Like I pointed out in the beginning that there were sleeves with buttons on. Or you could say, just the cuffs have buttons and two and two. Um, if you have less buttons than 12, obviously you still can use them. It's just less common that you see those in the SCA at least that I have seen. Um, but it probably, if you're just trying to use up scraps, it probably wouldn't hurt to have, have a few really small ones. Um, And just because historically I don't often see people using different color buttons doesn't mean that the modern eye doesn't want to use it that way. I know that a lot of people don't make everything 100% accurate. The dress that I'm wearing right now is not 100% accurate. Um, and I just thought I said, yep, you could use them as ANS tokens if you would like to do that as well. Um, there are a bunch of options that you can do with buttons, cuffs, dresses, hoods, ruffs, undershirts, just basic little neck closures. You can, you can do a lot with them, um, and practice. If you have less that you can actually fit, maybe you just want to use those as practice. Um, is there anything else that I could possibly answer for any of you? Okay, I'm not seeing anything else come through, so it seems like Probably done now. Uh, it's just about eight o'clock, so that timing worked very well. Uh,